This video will cover the topic of the financial statement assertions. These assertions relate directly to the substantive audit procedures that the auditor carries out during the audit process. In simple terms, the financial statement assertions represent the key objectives of the substantive audit procedures that are prepared. If a substantive procedure does not address an assertion, it does not assist the auditor in forming the opinion. The overall objective of the external auditor is to decide whether the financial statements are true and fair and properly prepared. True and fair can be described as free from bias, free from material misstatement and factually correct. The auditor should also ensure the accounts have been prepared using an appropriate reporting framework. We look at this when we look at the auditor reviewing the financial statements as a whole. However, when the auditor reviews the financial statements in detail, it is more difficult to relate the term true and fair to the individual balances and transactions that make up the whole set of accounts. How can they see whether a balance is true and fair? Therefore, to assist the auditor in planning audit procedures that review whether the balance is free from material misstatement, they are given the financial statement assertions. These are outlined in ISA 315. To help remember the assertions, I use Crave POC. The C is for completeness. The R is for rights and obligations. The A is for accuracy. The V is for valuation and allocation, and the E is for existence. Then the P is for presentation, the O is for occurrence, the C is for classification, and the final C is for cutoff. The assertion completeness is to ensure that all transactions and events recorded are present in the financial statements. Audit tests would be designed to identify if anything has been missed. An example would be reviewing the bank balances, including overdrafts. There is always a greater risk of items being missed in liabilities, and so the auditor requests a bank report to be sent directly to them from the bank confirming all balances. This will include any loans and overdrafts held at the year end. This will help confirm the completeness of bank and loan balances in the financial statements. The assertion rights and obligations is to ensure that ownership and responsibility of assets and liabilities is reviewed. Audit tests would be designed to identify if assets are owned by the entity and liabilities owed. An example would be the auditor inspecting invoices of assets purchased in the year to ensure they are in the company name. Accuracy is to ensure that all transactions, balances and other items have been accurately recorded. Audit tests are designed to identify individual misstatements. An example would be to select a sample of sales invoices and recalculate the balances. The valuation and allocation assertion is to ensure that items in the statement of financial position are in the correct place and at the correct values. Audit tests are designed to identify if the valuation is reasonable and if accounting standards have been used appropriately. An example would be performing analytical procedures on the depreciation charge for non-current assets, comparing the treatment to previous years and industry methods. Existence is to ensure that items in the statement of financial position actually exist. Audit tests are designed to assess whether assets are being used within the business. An example would be to physically inspect a sample of assets recorded in the asset register. Presentation is to ensure that transactions, events and disclosures are clearly described, relevant, understandable and required by the applicable financial reporting framework. There is a term used in the auditing standard ISA 315 stating that transactions should be appropriately aggregated and disaggregated. This simply means that items should be added together and shown separately where appropriate. Audit tests are designed to assess whether the information in the financial statements is presented properly and of assistance to the users.
An example test would be to compare the revenue figure in the statement of profit and loss to the revenue note to the accounts and general ledger to agree that the breakdown is presented clearly and accurately. Occurrence is to ensure transactions and events actually happened. Audit tests should be designed to identify if these events are real. An example would be to verify employees on the payroll report to ensure that they work for the entity. Classification is to ensure that transactions are in the proper accounts and items have been disclosed correctly. Audit tests should be designed to identify transactions posted to the wrong account. An example would be to review the asset and expense accounts for evidence that transactions may have been misclassified as an asset or expense. Finally, cut-off is to ensure transactions are recorded in the correct financial period. Audit tests are designed to identify if sales and purchase invoices have been recorded in the period where the goods were delivered or dispatched. An example would be to inspect the goods dispatch notes just before and after the year end and compare to the sales invoice recorded. If the delivery date is before the year end, the sale should be recorded this year. If the delivery is after the year end, it should be recorded in the following year. Each of these assertions should be used within the substantive testing phase. Each of the assertions within CRAVE, so completeness, rights and obligations, accuracy, valuation and allocation, and existence, are used to test balances within the statement of financial position. These would be all assets, liabilities and equity. Each of the assertions within POC, so presentation, occurrence, classification and cutoff, are used to test balances within the statement of profit and loss or income statement. These would be all income and expenses for the entity. There are a few assertions we have covered that are important for the whole of the financial statements and can therefore be used for all balances and transactions. These are completeness, as the auditor would need to review whether all transactions are present, accuracy, as all transactions tested should be flagged if not accurate, classification, as recording improper accounts crosses both statements, and presentation as the whole set of financial statements needs to be clear and understandable. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. This video is going to cover the area of gathering evidence. For us to understand the process of gathering evidence during the external audit assignment, we will need to cover which audit procedures gather evidence, the objectives, the quality of evidence required, the methods available, sampling and conclusions made from the evidence obtained. The external audit is made up of many audit procedures or audit tests. Each test will gather evidence to help the auditor form an opinion on the financial statements. The two main areas of audit procedures are controls procedures and substantive procedures. There is a clear difference between the two, and to be successful in an exam question which asks specifically for controls or substantive procedures, you must be confident with the differences. Control procedures are procedures which identify whether the control systems being reviewed actually work. Substantive procedures are procedures which identify material misstatements present in the financial statements. They will assist the auditor in giving the opinion whether the financial statements are true and fair. Controls procedures are carried out when an auditor is assessing the internal control systems which relate to the financial statements. The auditor has a responsibility to identify whether the control system is strong or weak. The system should then be tested by the auditor to gather evidence to back up their conclusion. An example would be when an auditor is reviewing the payroll system. A control identified could be if the payroll system has restricted access with the use of an encrypted password. A control procedure could be, with permission from the client, try to gain access to the payroll system without knowledge of the password. This procedure would not discover a material misstatement in the financial statements, 
but it does test whether the control the client has told you about works effectively. Substantive procedures are carried out in the main after the controls have been assessed. The level of substantive testing will depend on how reliable the control systems are, as the more reliable the controls, the less likely there will be material misstatements. The main aim of the auditor is to identify material misstatements and ensure the financial statements are true and fair. The objective of substantive procedures is broken down into the financial statement assertions. These are completeness, rights and obligations, allocation and valuation, existence, cutoff, occurrence, classification and accuracy. Crave Coker can assist in remembering these assertions. Every substantive test must achieve at least one assertion in its objective. These financial statement assertions are covered in more detail in another video. We have now identified the two main audit procedures, controls and substantive, discussed the differences and the objectives. Now we need to consider the quality of evidence required on an external audit. The quality of evidence is important in gaining confidence with the opinion made at the end of the audit process. ISA 500 tells us that audit procedures must be designed in such a way so that the auditor gathers sufficient appropriate evidence. So we need to understand what is sufficient and appropriate. We can define both sufficient and appropriate in relation to the auditor. Sufficient means enough evidence, so the auditor must obtain enough evidence to form an opinion. When deciding what is enough evidence, the auditor must consider the following. The risk of material misstatements identified at the planning stage. How material the balance or item is. How reliable the control systems are. The conclusions of the control tests performed previously. The size of the sample being tested and how reliable the evidence that can be collected is. Certain balances will be able to gather enough evidence with very little effort. For example, the bank balance in the financial statements can be confirmed by gathering evidence such as the bank statements, the bank report confirming balances direct to the auditor, and the bank reconciliation which reconciles the balance in the accounts to the bank statements. Other balances will require much more evidence to be obtained before the auditor is satisfied that it is sufficient. The term appropriate can be explained by splitting it into two areas. For evidence to be appropriate, it must be relevant and reliable. For evidence to be relevant, it must achieve the objectives. For example, evidence collected must achieve the objective of the audit procedure that gathered the evidence. If we're looking at control procedures, the evidence collected from these procedures should identify whether the control system operates effectively. If looking at substantive procedures, the evidence must achieve at least one of the financial statement assertions. Remember that these assertions help ensure the auditor can conclude whether the financial statements are true and fair. For evidence collected to be deemed reliable, it needs to be the best possible evidence that could be obtained in the circumstances. Evidence must be trusted so it can be used to form the audit opinion. Therefore, ideally, evidence should be independent, obtained directly by the auditor, if obtained from the client, then from a strong control system, written and in its original form. If auditors can obtain evidence that represents all of the points we've just mentioned, then very little else needs to be obtained for that area. There will be areas of the financial statements where this is difficult, and then more types of evidence will then need to be collected. Now we have covered the quality of evidence, we must discuss the methods available to the auditor to gather this evidence. When designing audit procedures, there are methods available that should be used by the auditor. ISA 500 gives eight methods that can be used to design audit procedures for both controls and substantive testing. Analytical procedures. 
This is the comparing of data in the financial statements to gather evidence on whether there are possible misstatements. Inquiry. Talking to the client staff and management will ensure explanations are obtained to help form conclusions. Inspection. Inspecting documentation that confirms balances and transactions in the financial statements as well as control procedures. Observation. Observing processes at the client to understand and review reliability. Recalculation. Recalculating transactions and balances for accuracy. Confirmation. Written confirmation of balances and transactions in the financial statements. And re-performance. The auditor carrying out a procedure the client has performed to see if they did it right. Each method can be used to design audit procedures and the most appropriate method should be selected. The next area of gathering evidence is choosing the transactions which should be tested. Sampling is defined in ISA 530 as the application of audit procedures to less than 100% of items within a population of audit relevance such that all sampling units have a chance of selection in order to provide the auditor with a reasonable basis on which to draw conclusions about the entire population. This requires auditor judgment and skill. There is always going to be an element of risk that a transaction not selected will contain a material misstatement. This is known as sampling risk. The auditor must ensure the sample size selected is sufficient enough to reduce sampling risk to an appropriate level. They must also ensure the sample chosen represents the whole population of transactions. The auditor decides on an appropriate method they should use to choose the sample to test. Again, the auditor has a number of options to choose from, and these options can be categorised into two headings statistical sampling methods and non-statistical methods. Statistical sampling methods generally are where the auditor has not influenced the selection of transactions. Random selection and probability theory are the common examples of choosing a sample in this way. Any other method would be categorised as non-statistical sampling. Methods commonly used by the auditor to select samples are random number tables which select the transaction numbers on the list to choose, systematic selection where the transaction is selected across the population using an even pattern for example every tenth balance chosen, block selection where transactions are selected from one period in the financial year and cutoff testing is an example of this, monetary unit selection where the largest balances and transactions are selected to test, if mistakes are found, they are more likely to be material. And haphazard methods. These are any other methods that could be used by the auditor to select transactions. The auditor should be careful not to allow bias. Gathering evidence for the audit is critical in forming an opinion on the financial statements. Auditors identify what type of evidence is needed from the objectives. The auditor will either be gathering evidence via control procedures to test whether controls work or via substantive procedures to test whether there are material misstatements in the financial statements. They must consider the quality of evidence that is required and available to them. This will depend on what is being reviewed but they must ensure evidence collected is sufficient and appropriate. There are eight methods available to them which they design their audit procedures around. And the auditor must also decide on the size of the sample of transactions to test as well as the method of selecting the sample to perform the audit procedures. Statistical or non-statistical is acceptable. Once the evidence has been gathered and the audit procedures performed, the auditor must then review what they have found. If, for example, misstatements have been found, they must decide whether these are material or not. If material, they could be misleading to the users of the accounts if they remain. The auditors therefore ask the client to amend the financial statements. If not material, they must record on a spreadsheet 
often called the summary of unadjusted errors. All of these smaller errors collected could accumulate into a material misstatement, and so the spreadsheet can be reviewed at the end of the audit for evidence of this. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. This video will cover the audit of smaller entities and not-for-profit organisations or NFPs. The aim is to identify how the audit would differ when reviewing the two entities' financial statements. Auditors must be capable of auditing the entity under review. Having experience in auditing a smaller entity or a not-for-profit organisation such as a charity is important. If they miss something important, they may issue an inappropriate opinion in the audit report at the end of the audit process. The Ethical Code states that one of the fundamental principles that should be followed is professional competence. This also enforces the importance of understanding the client and its industry. We are going to start by looking at the audit of a smaller entity. This entity may not even require a statutory audit in some countries. Smaller entities are given an exemption from audit in the UK, for example, but they may still request an audit if they feel it benefits them. The reasons for not requiring a statutory audit are The shareholders are often the directors of the entity, operating and managing their own business, and so there is less concern about whether their investment is being looked after. They may have only a few members of staff. This makes the disruption of the auditors coming in more of a burden on the company. Audits are expensive. This cost may outweigh any benefits an audit would have for the company. Control systems may be limited. With fewer resources, the systems may be more straightforward and not requiring expert advice from the auditor. If a smaller entity requires an external audit, the auditors would ensure that they have the correct audit team in place with the experience needed to conduct the audit properly. An audit of this kind has advantages and disadvantages. Some advantages are that it can be relatively low audit risk. If a business operates in a straightforward field that is easily understood by the auditor, there will be fewer transactions and therefore more time to review the business more thoroughly. In some audits, it may even be more effective to test 100% of the transactions. The shareholders run the company. With direct control, the management will have full understanding and responsibility for the organisation and can assist the auditor effectively. They may be met with less resistance from management because of this. The systems will often be straightforward and easier to understand, and this makes the assessment of control systems and their reliability easier. Some disadvantages are, due to the direct control of the company by the shareholders, they are in a position to manipulate the figures in the financial statements or hide personal expenses. Simple systems can often be manual. This increases the risk of human error, which needs to be addressed by the auditor and identified. Due to limited staff, there may be a lack of segregation of duties. Having one staff member responsible for an entire control system can increase the risk of fraud. They may not be very formal in their communications. Documentation on systems may be limited. Minutes of board meetings may be non-existent. This limits the amount of written evidence the auditor can obtain from the client. To conclude, depending on the specifics of the small business, there may be elements of an audit that are far more straightforward than dealing with a larger organisation. There will possibly be less substantive testing. However, careful planning is still needed to assess the risks and review the control systems and any limitations, to identify whether fraud risk is high and decide how to approach the audit. Not-for-profit organisations include charities and public sector entities. The way these entities are structured and how to prepare their financial information will be significantly different to how a private sector entity would operate. 
it is even more important that specialised audit staff are involved in the audit process for this kind of entity. The key differences we would see with a not-for-profit organisation are they are not driven by profits. Their objectives may vary, but as an example, it could be to provide a service and not to make money. They will not have shareholders. There will be no investors looking for a return on their money and there will be no dividend payments. The format of the financial information being presented will also be different. For example, a charity would prepare a statement of financial activities which is formatted differently to a statement of profit and loss as they are not in operation to make a profit. Auditing not-for-profit organisations come with their own audit risks. An example of some of these are as with smaller entities, their resources are restricted and so there may be a lack of segregation of duties and simple systems not documented. This could increase the risk of fraud and error. These entities are controlled by trustees. They often work part-time and they may not have the expertise or time to make good strategic decisions. Volunteers are used to keep costs down. They may lack skills and make mistakes, but also they may not stay long and then not be available to assist the auditor with explanations after the year end. Income may depend on external factors. Government grants may be needed, which may depend on criteria being met and changes in these criteria being made. Donations may also be relied upon, which may depend on the economic climate and their public profile. They may have very complex regulations to follow. These must be understood by the auditor to ensure they can assess whether they have been followed correctly, and this increases the risk of disclosure notes being inadequate. The going concern review is more difficult. As there is often reliance on donations and grants for income, external factors are very important in assessing the survival of the entity. Any sudden change in circumstances could affect the entity short term. The audit approach for this type of entity should include careful planning. The materiality percentage will be low to address the high risk. This will increase the amount of audit testing performed. A specialised audit team will be required. If controls are not deemed effective, pure substantive testing may be required. Analytical procedures will be useful. If control systems are limited, they will provide the auditor with evidence to assess whether further testing is necessary. And if there are any issues gathering the evidence needed to form an audit opinion, as always the auditor may need to modify their audit report. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. This video is the first of a series that will take you through some practical examples of substantive audit procedures you can carry out on specific balances in the financial statements. We will cover the general principles in designing and performing audit procedures, some general procedures you can perform on any balance, and then substantive audit procedures for non-current assets, bank receivables, inventory, estimates, trade payables, the statement of profit and loss, and share capital, reserves and directors emoluments. This video will cover the general principles, general procedures and non-current assets. We have covered the topic of gathering evidence in another video. Many of the principles discussed relate to substantive audit procedures. It is recommended that you review the gathering evidence and financial statement assertion videos before you watch this one. It will give you a better understanding of what we are covering here. Remember, substantive audit procedures are procedures that identify if material misstatements are present within the financial statements. They are testing the transactions, balances and disclosures for these misstatements. The steps to performing a substantive test are Identify the item to test and set the objectives of the test. Consider the quality of evidence required. It must be sufficient and appropriate. 
Design the test and ensure it meets the objective. Select the sample of transactions to perform the test on. Record the test, method, results and other evidence as working papers in the audit file. Consider the conclusion of the test. Is further work required? Are there material misstatements to be amended in the financial statements? The objective of a substantive test must be at least one of the financial statement assertions, again covered in the Gathering Evidence and Financial Statement Assertions videos. As a recap, here are the financial statement assertions. Completeness, Rights and Obligations, Allocation and Valuation, Existence, Cut-off, Occurrence, Classification and Accuracy. There are many examples of practical substantive tests. We are going to discuss a few for each area of the financial statements you would typically see in the exam. This will give you some specific practical ideas you can use. Before we do this, there are some things you could do for any balance. Some ideas can be remembered using TOAD. T is trial balance. Auditors will want to ensure that the financial reporting system agrees with what has been presented in the financial statements. An audit procedure would therefore be to agree the balance in the financial statements to the trial balance. Any balances not included in the financial statements would then be investigated with the client. O is opening balance. Every balance in the Statement of Financial Position will have an opening balance carried forward from the previous year. For the closing balance to be correct, the opening balance must also be correct. An audit procedure would therefore be to agree the opening balance to last year's closing balance and investigate any differences with the client. A is Add Up and Recalculate. There is always something the auditor can add up. All balances need to be checked for accuracy. Examples could be to add up the receivables list to agree the balance. Recalculate a sample of employees net pay. Or add up the bank reconciliation. Each of these and many more will ensure the assertion accuracy is achieved. D is disclosure check. The auditor needs to ensure that any specific guidance on how the balance or disclosure is formed and presented has been followed. They therefore need to review any specific accounting standards relating to the area of the financial statements and ensure they have been followed when preparing the financial statements. With a few general procedures out of the way, we can now look at some specific balances you might see in an exam. We will start with non-current assets. In order to ensure non-current assets are audited effectively, the auditor will need to review the financial statements, including the Statement of Financial Position and the non-current asset note, the Asset Register, which includes all details relating to the assets held by the company, and the Trial Balance and Ledger Accounts, forming the non-current asset balance. Each of these sources should tie in with one another and it is the auditor's job to test whether that is the case. Non-current assets key assertions to be verified are completeness, rights and obligations, valuation and existence. If we visualise the non-current asset note, the auditor needs to ensure each balance has been audited, therefore auditing opening and closing balances new assets purchased or additions, disposals of assets in the year, depreciation and revaluations. Audit procedures for opening and closing balances include agreeing the opening balance to last year's financial statements, adding up the non-current asset note to ensure the auditor agrees with the closing balance shown, and agree the closing balance for non-current assets in the note to the balance shown on the Statement of Financial Position. For new assets purchased, audit procedures include agreeing the additions balance in the financial statements to the asset register. This will verify completeness. 
adding up the additions in the asset register to ensure they agree with the total in the financial statements. This also verifies completeness. And for additions in the year, trace to the invoice to agree the amounts recorded and whether the invoice is in the company name. This verifies rights and obligations. For disposals in the year, the auditor should obtain a list of all disposals of assets made in the year and agree to the asset register to ensure that they have now been removed. They can agree disposals to documentation, for example sales receipts and bank statements to prove that they were disposed of. And review the profit or loss on disposal and agree with what has been recorded in the statement of profit and loss. These verify existence and accuracy. Depreciation must be audited by recalculating the depreciation charge for a sample of assets, reviewing the accounting policies to see if the treatment being used is consistent with prior years, and inspecting the budgets for capital expenditure to see if plans for disposals and new assets mean the depreciation methods are appropriate. These will help you verify valuation and accuracy. The revaluation of assets must be carefully reviewed. Some ideas for procedures would be to inspect the valuer's report and agree the amount concluded by them with what has been recorded in the financial statements. Review the method used by the valuer described in their report and ensure they agree with what is required by the accounting standards for revaluations. The key for an auditor is to gather as much sufficient appropriate evidence when performing these types of audit procedures. Remember that the more written, detailed, independent evidence they can collect, the better. Each audit procedure must verify at least one of the financial statement assertions that is key to the balance being audited. I hope you found this video useful. When ready, move on to the next video which covers the audit of current assets. This video will cover some practical ideas and examples of how an auditor will audit current assets. We are going to cover the audit of bank, receivables, estimates and inventory. Bank is an asset presented in the financial statements. It is shown under the heading current assets in the statement of financial position. The key assertions that should be verified are existence and valuation. The evidence that the auditor would obtain to audit the bank balance can be referred to as the three Bs. These are the bank statement, the bank report and the bank reconciliation. The bank statement is a piece of independent evidence. It will show all movements in the bank balance during the period that can be agreed with the movements in the cash book. It can also be used to agree the balance used in the bank reconciliation and make sure it agrees with the bank records. This evidence verifies existence and valuation. The bank report is written confirmation from the bank. It is sent directly to the auditor from the bank and so is a brilliant piece of evidence as it is independent, direct, written and in its original form. The bank report confirms all of the bank balances held by the client for the year. It will also confirm any balances of liabilities held by them, so it will assist the audit of that area of the financial statements also. The auditor should ensure the bank accounts have been included in the financial statements by agreeing the bank accounts of the trial balance. The balance itself may not agree due to timing differences and so they should also agree the balances to any bank reconciliations prepared. This verifies existence, valuation and also completeness. The bank reconciliations will show the differences between what the cash book states as the bank balance and what the bank states as the balance for each bank account. If the client prepares these, the auditor must inspect them and ensure the movement between the balances is not due to a material misstatement. One of the first procedures is to cast or add up the bank reconciliation to ensure there are not arithmetic mistakes. 
they should also ensure the balances agree to the bank statement, bank report and cash book. They would then audit the timing differences. Any payments that have not yet cleared the bank are unpresented cheques. The auditor would need to verify that all of these payments have been included correctly and so would usually agree the amounts on the bank reconciliation to the cheque stubs and cash book. Ensure none of the payments are missing or belong in the following period. And inspect the bank statements after the year end to ensure the payments have now cleared, investigating any that have not. Then any uncleared receipts would be audited. They would need to agree that all uncleared receipts on the bank reconciliation are in the cash book. Ensure that there are no missing receipts from the cash book and inspect the bank statements after the year end to ensure the receipts have now cleared. The next balance to review is the receivables balance. This balance is actually made up of two in the ledger, the trade receivables and any provision for bad debts. We therefore need to look at some practical ideas how to audit not just receivables but the estimate that is the provision included. Firstly, let's look at trade receivables. There are three important tests that should carry out on this balance. Circularization, cash received after the year end and cut off. Circularization is writing to a sample of trade receivable customers requesting that they confirm the balance they owe from the records. This is a great independent piece of evidence as the letter is sent from the client requesting that the information is sent directly to the auditor. Not all responses will be received as it is not a legal requirement and so customers do not have to respond. The auditor can send follow-up letters or a call to the customer to request the information but should not harass them. If the response is sent and it agrees with the client ledger then there is no further work needed and it can be filed as evidence in the audit file. If the response does not agree with the ledger, the auditor will then need to complete a reconciliation between the client and customer balance to identify if the difference is due to timing issues or due to a misstatement. If there is no response, then the auditor may wish to investigate that the customer does in fact exist. An example would be to inspect post-year-end bank statements for evidence of customer payments. The auditor will also select a sample of receivable customer balances and then agree these balances to receipts in the post-year-end bank statements. This will again verify existence of these customers and any where there have been no payments should be investigated further. Cut-off testing should be performed to ensure the sales invoices recorded on the ledger are in the correct financial period. As receivables is an asset, they will be concerned that this balance may be overstated. The client may push invoices into the current year to make this balance and the revenue balance look healthier. The auditor should review invoices just before and after the year end and inspect their goods dispatch notes reviewing the delivery date to ensure they are in the correct period. The next step is then to audit the provision for bad debts. Like any estimate in the accounts, this is difficult to audit as there will be little in the way of external evidence. The key assertion to verify is valuation. This provision has been created by the client using their own judgment and so the auditor must obtain evidence to ensure they agree with it. Examples of procedures include comparing the provision to the previous year and investigating any differences. Other analytical procedures such as calculating the receivable days ratio and comparing to the previous year reviewing the aged receivables list and investigating old balances to see if they should be included in the provision or written off. Inquiry with management about any specific provisions and post year end event review to see if the customer has paid or is maybe now unable to repay the debt. 
The final balance to review from current assets is inventory. The key assertions are valuation, existence, completeness and rights and obligations. This balance has a very specific accounting standard which shows us how the balance should be included. The most important and remembered element from IS2 is that inventory should be valued at the lower of cost and net realisable value. The auditor must prove that the balance has been correctly accounted for to verify valuation. They should ensure they review sales around the year end. Sales prices of items should be compared to the calculations for net realisable value to ensure the selling price looks reasonable. They should also trace the cost used in valuation to the source documents such as the purchase invoice. Existence can be verified by attending the inventory count. If the auditor attends, they can observe the count and the actual inventory. This not only verifies this assertion, but it also enables the auditor to review the control procedures carried out by the client. The audit team would need to be organised and ensure there are staff available to attend the count. Whilst at the count, they also re-perform samples of the count to verify existence and completeness of the counting records. Inspection of ownership documentation should also be carried out. Review of the purchase invoices for them to be addressed to the client verifies rights and obligations. Also, inspection of any inventory stored at third-party warehouses needs to be carried out. The auditor should inspect agreements with the client and ensure inventory belongs to them. We have now covered some specific ideas in auditing the current asset balances. The next video will cover the audit of liability balances. Thank you for watching. This video will give you some practical examples in how auditors would audit some of the liability balances in the financial statements. We are going to discuss the audit of accruals, provisions, other payables and trade payables. Auditors must assess the risks associated with balances being materially misstated at the start of the audit when planning their audit procedures. The concern with liabilities is that the client may have understated the balance to make the business look healthier and more liquid than it is. With this in mind, the key assertion being tested is completeness. Other important assertions to verify are rights and obligations and valuation. The accruals balance will have been prepared by the client based on costs that may have not yet been invoiced in the year but belong to the current year. The auditor should obtain a breakdown of the accruals balance and ensure it adds up and agrees with the accruals balance in the financial statements. In addition to this, analytical procedures are useful here. As this is a balance where estimates have been used and judgments made by the client, it is open to manipulation. Therefore, key analytical procedures include comparing the accruals balance to last year and investigating differences and review invoices dated after the year end to identify if the cost belongs in the current year. Anything found should then be recorded as evidence and discussed with the client for possible amendment. Provisions may be included in the financial statements. The client needs to ensure they have followed IAS 37, Provisions, Contingent Liabilities and Assets, correctly. It is the auditor's job to review the evidence and decide whether a provision should be included. Provisions could arise from events such as potential compensation payments from court cases. Remember the rules from the standard. If there is a remote chance of the client suffering an outflow of resources, then there should be nothing included in the financial statements. If there is a possible chance of the client suffering an outflow of resources, then there should be a disclosure note called a contingent liability note explaining the possible event, but still no provision. If there is a probable outflow of resources, then a provision may be included in the financial statements and a disclosure note explaining the balance. There are three criteria that must be met for a provision to be allowed. 
There must be a present obligation due to a past event. There must be a probable outflow of resources. And there must be a reliable estimate. The final criteria is the sticking point. The auditor must gather evidence to be satisfied that all three criteria are present if a provision has been included. They must inspect correspondence, for example from the company lawyer, and also discuss the event with them. They can inspect any other external evidence, such as press reports, if it relates to a court case. They must then obtain evidence on the estimate of costs and ensure it is from a reliable source. This can be a lawyer, but must not be an estimate from the client management. Other liability balances include sales tax, employee tax, payroll and bank overdrafts. For each of these there is a piece of external evidence that can help verify the balance in the financial statements. The bank statement. Agree each of these balances to the bank statement as the payment should be shown after the year end. If not found, or if it does not agree, the difference should be discussed with the client. The only exception is the bank overdraft. This may not completely agree with the bank statement, as there may be timing differences. The same procedures will be applied to this balance as we have already discussed in the second video in this series looking at current assets. The bank reconciliation will also play a part in verifying the bank overdraft balance, along with the bank report. Trade payables is the total balance of all outstanding balances owed to trade suppliers. This could be a significant balance with many transactions and therefore several audit procedures will be carried out on many transactions selected. Audit procedures will include cut-off testing, reconciling supplier statements, post-year-end invoice review and some analytical procedures. As the payable balance is made up on purchase invoices, it is important to ensure that the invoices have been recorded in the correct period. The auditor must therefore review the invoices posted just before and after the year end where the risk of misstatement is high. The procedure would be to identify the invoices posted just before and after the year end, compare them to the goods received note, review the delivery date and ensure the invoice is posted in the correct period. If the delivery date is on or before the year end, the purchase and liability belongs this year. If not, it belongs in the following year. The client would receive supplier statements from the suppliers which will show the transactions such as invoices and payments made and the outstanding balance. These are usually sent monthly. The auditor should select a sample of suppliers and reconcile the supplier statements sent at the year end to the ledger. Timing differences such as invoices sent but not received at that point are acceptable but any other differences that cannot be explained should be investigated with the client. As completeness is an important assertion, the auditor must be satisfied that all transactions have been included. Therefore, inspecting purchase invoices since the year end and reviewing the detail will be required to ensure that there were not any invoices that should have been included in the current year. There are a few analytical audit procedures that can be carried out on the trade payables balance. These include comparing the balance to the previous year and investigating any significant differences, calculating the payable days ratio and comparing to the previous year, identifying the trade payables balance for each month and comparing the level of payables to the expected trend of the company and inspecting the aged payables analysis in particular, identifying the old and slow moving balances and investigating these with the client. In summary, we have looked at key liability balances that are regularly seen in the Statement of Financial Position. When auditing liabilities, the key assertion is completeness as it is possible the client may manipulate figures to reduce liabilities and costs. Analytical procedures are a very useful tool when reviewing these balances and reviewing transactions and events after the year end should not be overlooked as this may identify potential liabilities that have been missed. I hope you have found this video useful. The fourth video on the audit of specific balances will cover auditing balances in the statement of profit and loss, 
including directors' transactions and equity and reserves. This video will cover some practical ideas in how to audit the following areas of the financial statements. The statement of profit and loss, directors emoluments and the equity and reserves area. Each of these areas have some specific issues which need to be addressed by the auditor. Remember, much of the transactions in the statement of profit and loss have already been tested via the corresponding debit or credit balance that was included in the statement of financial position. Whether it be payroll, revenue, purchases or any of the expense accounts, there will already have been some evidence collected that we have already seen. The key assertions for the statement of profit and loss balances are cutoff, occurrence, completeness, classification and accuracy. The additional audit procedures that should be carried out on these cost and revenue balances would include some substantive analytical procedures and some specific audit work to ensure the assertions are verified. For the payroll balance, a few specific audit procedures include. For a sample of employee balances, Recalculate the deductions such as the tax and investigate any differences. Agree the net pay as per the payroll records to the bank statements and cash book. And agree total wages and salaries from the payroll system to the trial balance and the financial statements. Analytical procedures for payroll include proof in total of the wages and salaries balance. This is where the auditor will estimate the balance from the information obtained from the client, such as average wages and the percentage pay rise, and compare it to the actual balance. Any significant differences will be investigated. Also comparing the current year balance to the previous year will also identify potential misstatements if significantly different. The revenue balance substantive tests include For a sample of invoices, recalculate the sales tax and discounts for accuracy. Agree a sample of customer orders to the dispatch notes and invoices to ensure they were recorded. And inspect credit notes issued shortly after the year end and the supporting documentation for evidence that they were relating to actual sales and not created to overstate revenue. Analytical procedures would include comparing the revenue balance to the previous year, calculating and comparing gross profit margins to the previous years and comparing the balance to budgeted figures. The purchase and other expense balance procedures include inspecting purchase orders and agreeing these to the goods received notes and invoices recorded, recalculating sales tax and discounts on a sample of invoices, and agreeing the balance on the ledger to the trial balance and the financial statements. Analytical procedures include calculating the operating profit margin to compare to the previous year and investigating any significant differences and comparing each expense account to budget to identify anything to investigate further. Directors' emoluments are reviewed for accuracy. Remember that the auditors regard any director's transactions as material by nature and so must be satisfied that the transactions and disclosures are accurate. An example of audit procedures would be Obtain the detailed list of directors' transactions, which shows the split between wages, bonuses, pensions, etc., and cast it to ensure all of the totals are correct. Inspect payroll records and agree the balances to the list. And inspect bank statements and agree the amounts actually paid. And obtain a written representation from the directors that they have included all directors' remuneration to the auditor. The equity section of the Statement of Financial Position will include the following balances. Share capital, dividends, 
and other reserves. The financial statements will also include the statement of changes in equity which will show the movement in these balances from the beginning of the year. For each of these balances, ensuring the closing position agrees with the trial balance and the statement of financial position will be important. To audit share capital, the auditor will need to inspect share certificates or other official documentation and agree to disclosures made in the financial statements. Inspect board minutes for evidence of a share issue. And inspect the cash book for evidence of money coming in from a share issue. Dividends paid and included in the financial statements will require the auditor to inspect board minutes to ensure the amount and the date declared was before the year end. Inspect the bank statement and agree the amounts paid and that they were before the year end also. Other reserves could include the revaluation reserve as an example. To audit this balance, the auditor must ensure that the opening balance agrees to last year. The movements in reserves add up to the closing balance. And that any movements agree with supporting documentation, for example, a valuation report. There are many examples of good substantive audit procedures to carry out on individual balances within the financial statements. Having a strong understanding of the financial statements and how they are prepared will help you remember the key audit procedures that help identify material misstatements. Analytical procedures feature as a key substantive procedure for many of the balances included in these videos. These procedures allow the auditor to assess the risk of misstatements being present so they can decide whether to investigate further. Practice makes perfect. Reviewing procedures and practicing questions will ensure you retain this knowledge and grow in confidence. I hope you found these videos useful. This video will be covering the area of computer assisted audit techniques, widely known as CATS. When gathering evidence and performing audit procedures, the external auditor can often use computers and special techniques. This can improve efficiency and speeds up the audit process. The two main areas where this can help is with the controls work the auditor completes and the substantive testing stage of the audit process. When the auditor is assessing the control systems used by the client, they can use something called test data. When the auditor is performing substantive tests or procedures, they can use something called audit software. Test data is where the auditor will access the client's computer controls. They will perform audit tests on the system itself by entering dummy data into the system and monitoring how it progresses through the control cycle. This method of testing will allow the auditor to see if the control functions of the computer system perform properly. For example, they could enter a fictitious sales order in the sales ordering system and then monitor whether it is posted correctly and whether the controls over ensuring it is authorised before being accepted are effective. There are two ways the auditor can perform test data, live and dead data. Live data is where the auditor has access to test the computer systems during the operating hours for the client. The benefits of testing computer controls during working hours is that it allows the auditor to assess whether demand has an impact on the efficiency of the controls. It could detect that the system does not cope when there are multiple users, all posting onto and reviewing the data on the system. The drawbacks are that these dummy entries into the system may be forgotten and not reversed. There's nothing more embarrassing than the auditor being responsible for the misstatement detected in the following year's audit. Dead data is where the auditor can enter dummy data into a batch after working hours. This is easier to reverse as all entries are all together. Alternatively, the client may only permit the auditor to test the system by taking a copy to install on their own computer. This will remove the risk of leaving misstatements in the system altogether and very often the client feels most comfortable with this option. 
The drawback to this approach is the auditor will not have assessed whether the system can have problems when busy. However, this is still an effective way of testing the computer system controls. This is a cheap way of testing the computer controls of a client as it only requires the auditor and their skills. Without test data, the auditor is only testing the controls around the paperwork that is produced from the system plus any manual control systems the client may have. Therefore, this method ensures there is a thorough review of the entire control systems that relate to the financial statements and not just some of it. Our other method of CATS is audit software. This assists the auditor at the substantive testing stage where the auditor is performing audit procedures that help detect potential material misstatements. Audit software is a piece of software that is used by the auditor. There are many variations of this software around. Each of the larger audit firms have designed their own versions. They may also have bespoke audit software for clients with complex financial data. The smaller audit firms may purchase audit software from the larger firms. We just need an understanding of how generally audit software works. The auditor should be able to import all of the client's transactions and balances onto the audit software. Now they hold all of this data, the audit software is programmed to perform some audit procedures on it. Some of the procedures that can be performed are analytical procedures, selecting samples, checking calculations and exception reporting. The audit software would be programmed to calculate ratios. At a press of a button it can produce the results needed to compare to previous year's results, budgets and industry averages. The auditor can then investigate unusual results with the client to decide whether potential material misstatements may have occurred. The audit software can select samples of transactions to perform audit procedures. This is a systematic method of selecting the sample as it requires no influence from the auditor in choosing the sample to test. Audit software can also check calculations. It can be programmed to add up transactions to agree balances in the system and recalculate other transactions, for example VAT calculations. The software allows more of these calculations to be performed as it works faster than an audit team member with a calculator or an ad list. It also reduces the risk of human error on the audit. The software can also be programmed to produce exception reports. It can highlight unusual trends in the financial information that has been imported. It can also detect balances that look unusual. An example would be producing a list of balances on the receivables ledger that have credit balances, suggesting overpayments or possible missing invoices. These balances and transactions detected by the system can then be investigated by the auditor with the client for potential material misstatements. Audit software has many benefits, including it can save time on the audit due to automatic procedures being carried out by the software. It can then also save on labour costs for the audit assignment. And it also reduces the risk of human error due to the software automatically performing some of the audit procedures. Drawbacks include the expense. If a bespoke system is needed or if the audit firm has to purchase the software, this can be very expensive. They therefore need to ensure the benefits of using the software outweigh the price. Clients are often apprehensive allowing their system to be connected to the client system when importing the transactions. There is a risk of data corruption when carrying out this process. As the auditor is now holding all transactions and balances on the software, there is a risk that this data could be leaked and therefore confidentiality would be a concern. Strong security controls are required. To summarise, CATS are computer assisted audit techniques. They assist with assessing control systems at the clients by performing test data. They also assist with performing substantive audit tests using audit software held by the audit firm. CATS ensure the transactions and systems are tested more thoroughly. 
they also potentially reduced costs and speed up the audit process. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. This video will discuss how the external auditor relies on the work of others. We must understand who the auditor would rely on and why, considerations made before reliance is placed, and relying on evidence from service organisations. During the audit process, the auditor must ensure they obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. In order to do this, they may need to obtain evidence from individual parties who can then back up the auditor's findings to ensure they come to an appropriate opinion on the financial statements. This may be due to a lack of technical knowledge on a matter or it is the most efficient way of obtaining evidence. We can split when auditors rely on others into two groups. When the auditor uses their own expert and when they rely on the client's experts. Auditors may use their own experts in the following situations. Using a property valuer to verify property figures in the financial statements. Bringing in an inventory expert to assist with valuing specialist inventory such as jewellery. Experts to assist with work in progress values in the financial statements and legal advice on provisions made for any legal cases connected to the client. When an auditor uses their own expert, they must assess their competence and independence from the client. If they're going to rely on their work, they need to ensure they will still be able to form an appropriate independent auditor opinion overall. ISA 620 states that the auditor is to ensure that they obtain sufficient appropriate evidence from the expert so they can provide reasonable assurance on the client's financial statements. In order for the evidence to be adequate for the audit, the auditor should review qualifications, experience and membership to any professional bodies and review any connections with the client to identify any business or personal relationships with them. This is to ensure objectivity will not be affected. Any use of an independent expert should be communicated to the client before work begins. This is usually laid out in the engagement letter, so both parties agree to the terms of the audit at the start of the audit process. Auditors may also wish to rely on experts used by the client in operating their business and preparing the financial statements. This could be relying on the client's lawyer's documentation for assessments of legal provisions and disclosure in the financial statements, or relying on the internal auditor's work to assist with the external audit. The internal audit department would be a fundamental part of the entity's control system. They also carry out procedures on the control systems connected to the financial statements, identify deficiencies and implement changes. The external auditor must also assess control systems for deficiencies. This helps them plan whether controls can be relied upon and decide the level of substantive testing needed. Therefore, the type of work the auditor could rely on would be tester control, risk assessment and any special investigations such as fraud investigations. For any experts used by the client, care needs to be taken before the auditor can go ahead and rely on any of their work as evidence. The auditor must consider the following. The scope of work. The auditor should review the level of detail put in by the client expert. Remember, the auditor must provide reasonable assurance on the financial statements and therefore there must be sufficient detailed work carried out by the expert. If the work is not sufficient, the auditor will need to carry out further work or gather further evidence on this area. Technical competence. The auditor must assess whether the expert has the required technical competence to carry out the quality of the work required. The auditor should review qualifications and experience of the expert to assess whether reliance can be placed. Report quality. Evidence collected is fundamental in forming an independent opinion. If sufficient appropriate evidence cannot be obtained, the expert cannot be relied upon wholly. 
For example, it may be that the internal auditor communicates much of their findings with presentations or discussions with the Board of Directors. Ideally, auditors want detailed written evidence and without it they may still need to carry out further work themselves. Independence If used by the client themselves, independence is unlikely. In many cases the internal auditors are employees. However, if an audit committee is formed of non-executive directors and they liaise with the internal auditors, then independence from the board is improved. The less independence the expert has from the entity, the less reliance can be placed on their work. Finally, let's look at the considerations the auditor makes on relying on a service organisation used by the client. This is an outsourced function the client has used instead of having a fully functioning department employed by the business. A popular example is the payroll department being outsourced to a skilled payroll company. If the client outsources one of its functions such as payroll, the auditor must understand the service organisation and assess the risk of material misstatements. Decide on the level of audit testing and design audit procedures appropriate in identifying potential material misstatements. And consider visiting the service organisation. Advantages of the client using a service organisation include increased expertise and skills which potentially reduce material misstatements and increased independence from directors which improves reliability. Disadvantages include being able to obtain information on a timely basis which may be difficult. They may not be allowed to perform audit work at the service organisation and this could lead to not being able to obtain sufficient appropriate evidence which would affect the audit opinion. There are many sources who can assist the auditor in gathering evidence. The key is to assess whether these experts are needed before the audit commences. That way the auditor can plan the work required so evidence can be collected on a timely basis and no disruption is made to the audit and ultimately the forming of the audit opinion. I hope you found this video useful. Thank you for watching.